The greatest education, at least the way we've learned, is giving people the transparency and exposure to your own numbers. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the great pleasure of introducing the founding partners of Blue Water, Todd Huizington and Ari Bose. Todd serves as the Chief Strategy Officer at Blue Water, bringing with him a wealth of experience and a fervent commitment to innovation in architecture and engineering. In his current capacity, Todd leads Blue Water's investment and growth strategies, capitalizing on his established track record of enhancing operations and achieving substantial growth. Before co-founding Blue Water, Todd redefined his skills at the IBI Group, now known as Arcadis, where he led a diverse portfolio of projects spanning large transit infrastructure developments, automotive manufacturing facilities, innovative experience centers, and technological solutions. His expertise covers the entire project lifecycle from initial pursuit through to meticulous planning and execution of large-scale endeavors. With a proven performance in negotiating and managing projects valued at up to $2 billion in construction and generating over $100 million in A&E fees. Todd's proficiency in project management and team leadership is highly esteemed within the AE community. Ari Bose assumes the role of Chief Growth Officer at Blue Water with a focus on shaping the future of architecture and engineering organizations. An accoladed architect with an extensive experience across various sectors, Ari's dedication to design excellence and exceptional client service epitomizes the ethos of Blue Water. In his capacity as Chief Growth Officer, Ari directs many of the firm's investments and marketing focused initiatives. Prior to co-founding Blue Water, Ari held a leadership position at the IBI Group, now Arcadis, where he led the building practices in the US. His responsibilities at IBI included strategic growth, practice leadership, design innovation, client relationship management, and alternative project delivery for significant private and public sector clients. He's a licensed architect in both the US and various provinces in Canada, and Ari is a distinguished member of the RAIC and AIA. He continues to advocate for the transformative potential of design through his participation in conferences, design competitions, and scholarly contributions. In this episode, we'll be talking about mergers and acquisitions and Blue Water's role in acquisitions of architecture firms. We talk about what's needed for a successful acquisition and what kind of architecture practices are suitable to be acquired and we also look at why architecture firms might want to go through that process what the founders need to be able to do what the business needs to be able to demonstrate so this is a really fascinating conversation a quite a unique and innovative uh, business model that i think will strengthen many many architectural businesses and strengthen the industry as a whole so sit back relax and enjoy Harry Bose and Todd Hoisington. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals this episode is sponsored by Smart Practice Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Ari and Todd, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you both? Doing well, thank you. Great, thanks, Thanks Ryan. Thanks for having us. Excellent to have you guys on the show. I was very excited to um, come across what it is that you guys are doing with Blue Water. Uh, you've both had a tremendous amount of uh, experience in the architectural industry. Uh, you're both um, working at Arcadis, that's correct? You correct, work, yes. yes. And, and over time, your careers have evolved into something quite unique and led you to setting up and founding Blue Water, which is a strategic growth platform for architects and, and engineers. So why don't we jump in there and perhaps you could... Tell us a little bit about how would you describe what Blue Water is 
And how did your career path unfold into, into this pathway? Sure. Um, yeah, so you talk a little bit about us being an Arcadis. Uh, prior to that, we were at a, a, a large AE firm, uh, 3,500 people, and then went into a bigger one. Um, so we, we had a lot of transitions in our career. So we were, we were a group, Ari and I worked together, and we managed a, a group of companies that then started building a better team. We then got acquired. Um, through a lot of that, and we could have longer conversation about it, but through a lot of that, we, we saw a lot of the pluses and minuses of how that goes, what it does to teams, how you can um, create powerful teams or destroy them um, through wrong actions. We had a, a, a acquisition spree of our own in previous times that didn't go well. Um, we then went through mm-hmm. a correction of that, and then we were acquired. So we saw a lot of different uh, angles of it, and uh, we saw a lot of opportunity um, that aligns with a lot of the stuff you talk about on the podcast about uh, improving business uh, operation in the AE world. And uh, with all that, we had a lot of fun with it. We had a lot of fun working together on those things. And we saw the business opportunity with kind of the fractured architecture environment in, in North America. And uh, it kind of born an opportunity to uh, take a different role in the industry and but provided a lot of value doing of doing the things we had a lot of fun at mm-hmm. so it's it's quite interesting actually when we talk about acquisitions and mergers in the architectural space I know a lot of firms would like to be acquired often this is a kind of exit strategy for the founders um, it doesn't always work out like that because an architecture firm is not often as as valued as perhaps the the partner owns. And also there's so many kind of cultural complexities that we need to be aware of. Um, Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about, you know, for for those who don't know, what is is mergers and acquisitions? What does it mean? Yeah, I mean, essentially our platform is is around, uh, I would say, largely acquisitions at this point. Um, Mm -hmm. Mergers will come once we have developed kind of our, I'd say, standalone firms, which then need to grow, the mergers will come as opportunity to expand those firms. Um, Mm -hmm. Acquisitions in our world, basically the blue water world is essentially, um, we acquire anywhere between 51 to 70% of an organization, um, because one of the three tenets of our principle is that uh, the existing ownership needs to have skin in the game and continue Mm -hmm. to grow their value. But it's not only just the existing leadership, but the opportunity to bring other leaders into the practice. Um, right. And there's, you know, lots of changing attitudes around ownership in the industry right now. And a lot of people are finding it hard to transition leadership because um, certainly generationally things are changing around thoughts around ownership and things like that. So yeah. um, I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but I was trying to answer it through the lens of Blue Water and how we do mergers and acquisition. Well, perhaps, yeah. Perhaps we could talk a little bit about what does a good transition look like or a good acquisition look like? And what does it look like when it's done badly? And you kind of pointed there that you've you've experienced both and that's part and parcel where the the intention for Blue Water has arisen. Yeah, absolutely. Ari's, uh, you know, comment about the ownership percentage is very unique. We don't, we don't know anybody else that's doing it exactly that way. There's certainly some others that are, you know, starting to add some of those components. But this is a people-based business. This is, I mean, we have opportunities for technology that we're very optimistic on, but it is a people-based business, and that's really important. And so we want people to participate in that ownership. That's not just by accident. Some of the key parts of a successful transition, like you said, Ryan, is, um, what's really hard for owners when you, when you said that they they do look for exit opportunities, um, you know you've started a firm, you've gone maybe it's 15 years, maybe it's 45 years, uh, uh, and it's hard to transition out of that. But they're typically you know put to say, do I sell out to a much bigger company or do I yeah. transition to my my team? And and the values of those will be very different. Um, yeah. And it's it offers them an opportunity to do both a little bit. They can continue. The name can continue on. Uh, the t- team can continue on and, and get uh, the opportunities that they probably always envision coming into a smaller firm. But those those go hand in hand because they participate in the value of it. And when you can mm-hmm. do that, the key tenant of the, the success of it is they're engaged. They are part of the team. They are part of the ownership. And where we've seen that uh, transition badly, like you said, to look at the opposite side of it, 
is you you take away empowerment, you take away um, authority uh, because there's some higher power that comes in, and then all of a sudden people are reduced in their roles. They aren't uh, in charge of their teams. They don't have any authority to take out things and run the business uh, um, as they see. So that mm-hmm. I would say on one side, on the other side, um, you know much aligned with the things you talk about on on your podcast uh, on a regular basis is improving the business is is bringing more you know we call it kind of blue water best practices um, but we help bring that vision to build the people's skill sets um, because that doesn't happen a lot in small firms usually the way firms uh, start is you start by a few people that are probably really good designers have client relationships uh, grow work, but they never take a business course along the way. They never get kind of business mentorship along the way. Um, and we we bring that to help broaden their careers as well. So not only do we not want them to lose empowerment when they, when they are acquired, we actually want it to grow um, and have them develop more skill set and more authority to carry out that skill set. Um, um, if I may add to that, you know, there's a couple of things that we I think we recognize a lot through the transitions we have had in other firms is one, you know, these firms are generally architectural firms and this firm sizes we are looking at. It's a legacy, you know, it's, it's somebody's life's work. And even though they want to exit there, there are things that they're struggling with in terms of what's going to happen to my legacy. And so you've got to recognize that. The second thing is you cannot go in on day one and start doing changes. Every firm has its own DNA. And right. we have to understand the DNA. So we spend a lot of amount of time trying to understand what is the DNA of the firm, what makes them tick, while, you know, Todd is talking about the improvement. So how do we start bringing in small step, step improvements? But you cannot just go in on day one and think, hey, we are going to improve this part. We can see there are some issues, but there are other things that makes the firm tick. So you have to understand that that right balance before you can start doing these changes. And and is Blue Water's role then in the mergers and acquisitions, are you acquiring organizations yourself or are you more brokering the deals or are you preparing companies to be acquired by other larger organizations? Oh, that's a great question. No, we, we are acquiring them um, and we are um, we we hesitantly say managing them because our intention is to not manage the firms. We we describe our own roles as fractional executives um, because yeah. we do come in. We we make sure our early we we have a ninety day plan that we have in most uh, firms. Um, and Ari was kind of say it's not a one size fits all. We do it is bespoke to um, what is where their current situation, what their opportunities are, which are not uh, all created equal. And mm-hmm. we, we definitely get involved in the strategic planning, um, help facilitate that so they can help create what their vision is. Um, if we think it's bigger, we'll help push at that uh, and then provide the, the tools and, and uh, support to then go create that. Um, and in an ideal world, we would, we would step away a little bit, step back a little bit, always be there for support. Um, it might be augmenting the team with somebody with a different skill set. Maybe it brings a different market sector, things like that. We help facilitate those because those are difficult things in firms a lot of times. Um, mm-hmm. But it's not uh, we're not handing it off as a as a as a broker in any way. It's it's owned by Blue Water. Got it. Okay, so so Blue Water becomes like a large holdings company for yeah. lots of different architectural firms. Yep. And then the peop- um, and then do you have? investors that are investing into the shares of Blue Water as a total. And then you've got a kind of portfolio of architecture businesses, which are you're basically improving them and getting them to operate at a higher level. And then there's a dividend share for investors. That's that's exactly right. And we have uh, four market areas. So we, we've talked about that kind of portfolio word for a while. Well, we invest mm-hmm. in firms in the education, residential, um, transportation or uh, industrial and more more light industrial uh, space. So those are four market areas that um, have very uh, strong mega trends behind them that we know are probably right. going to be pretty strong for the next 10 to 15 years at minimum. Um, and so we do look at them a little bit as portfolios. Um, and and we, our goal um, is to build really strong uh, industry leading brands. So our goal is in each of those four areas is to have an industry leading educational uh, brand, have an industry leading residential brand and, and transportation brand, so on, um, that's helping innovate uh, those areas. So it's, it's bringing a lot of things to that. It, it's quite, it's quite amazing, actually. I've never, I've never 
come across maybe cvg is the, is the nearest thing that i know that has kind of ownership of lots of different architectural practices um but it's this is quite a unique proposition um is it risky what and what kind of investors do you like to work with and what sorts of investors like to invest with you are they other architects or experts in the industry or completely unrelated fields so our, so our, we have a one principal investor behind us that uh has yes. is has supported our, our business model enough for what we have envisioned right now, um, which I could we, we've put out publicly that is our goal of a hundred million dollars in acquisitions uh, to build that, and we think that's what's uh, required to build the scale in each of those portfolios to get that momentum um, to the point that we can be the industry leader in those. Um, so that's all. Mm -hmm. That's where our principal investment comes from uh, right now. But uh, what we do envision as an opportunity. Uh, is other you know owners of firms as well that you know may have done really well have built a little bigger company is probably not going to happen with a, a really small company yeah. that they could participate as investors too so we've created our our business model as the opportunity for that as well and when we started at Ryan we did seed fund ourselves so the three right. founders we seed funded this so we were not dependent on an investor to to start off um, which we thought was really important because mm -hmm. um, Nobody knows this industry. I mean, I shouldn't say nobody knows, but we definitely know this industry a lot. We're subject matter experts, I would say, in that case. So um, so it gives a lot of confidence to other investors to know that, that the people who started this have invested in it themselves. And, I, and I'd say, Ryan, that, that kind of goes to your the other, a different part of your question that you had there. Is it, is it risky? Um, I would say, you know, I had a conversation about this yesterday with somebody and I'd say I don't feel like it's risky because we're not trying to pull off um, and, a, and a big differentiator for what we were trying to do and for lots of purpose of where we saw it go poorly in the past um, is we're not trying to pull off some big financial miracle. Yeah. What we're trying mm -hmm. to do is find really solid underlying architecture and engineering businesses. We are yeah. architects and engineers ourselves, the three founders. I'm a civil engineer. Ari is an architect. Our other founder is a civil engineer. Um, we've been in this industry with varying roles in that. And uh, so the underlying business is something we really understand well. We're not trying to pull off uh, some financial complexity here. Well, I mean, every business is fraught with risk, right, of some kind. Sure. Uh, so to that extent, yes, it, you know, every business has some risk in it. But to Todd's point, I think is... Um, you know, this is one of the architecture and engineering are one of the oldest professions. And, yeah. and even if you look at kind of everything that's going on in the investment around the world right now, you would start seeing that there's a lot of, I would even say private equity and family offices starting to look at architectural firms because good solid architectural firms are actually really strong mm -hmm. cash flow um, devices. If you if you're yeah. looking for something which is solid, so to that extent, I would say we are we are a safe, safer bet as an industry than. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are not presented with challenges. I mean, technology presents probably one of the biggest challenges and risks this industry mm -hmm. has ever faced. Um, I would say that over the years we have coped better over time, but we are still laggards when it comes to technology adoption. And, and that's one of our main kind of tenets of Blue Water is that mm -hmm. in, in three years or four years, when people look at the firms we own um, and invest in, we are not going to go promote Blue Water, but people are going to know that, hey, they do this thing differently because they are a Blue Water firm. And that's kind of our grander, larger vision for what Blue Water looks like, that the firms we Got it. invest in um, do things differently, especially when it comes to technology adoption. Could you walk us through what it looks like then for you to identify a potential candidate for acquisition? What kind of maturity are you looking for in the business? What kind of, I mean, you mentioned there a little bit the sort of sectors that you're, that you're keen on, but what does the business need to be doing and how does it need to be performing? And what sorts of leaders of organizations make for good kind of partners with you? You, you just hit all the all the key points. Uh, so there's there's a financial aspect, uh, there's a people aspect, and then there's a market aspect. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of other things, obviously, uh, that go into it. It's, it's a very complex uh, process, no doubt. But those are the key. Those are the key things. When we first look at a company, we you know 
whether we've sought after them or, or somebody sought after us, um, there's initial uh, package of financial information and we look at um, revenue growth. Um, so you can look, is it, is it growing or is it shrinking? And, and neither of, there's no, um, in the things I'll go through, there's not a single thing that would tell us to not uh, go after it. There's a thing right. that either shows a health um, and, and strength or it shows a weakness and an opportunity. Um, so if it, uh, but, but primarily we want, you know, businesses that are growing um, and, and that shows a good uh, underlying team in business. Clients want them. Um, mm -hmm. The market's strong. Um, then we look at consistency. Uh, consistency, when you look at EBITDA or profitability, or a simpler word is is when it's up and down a lot. That shows some 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 things that need to be looked at further in the business. Is it is it the way they're operating? Is it the way they're controlling the business? Or is it the cycle of their projects? And I'll tell you, one of the biggest things that we hear is when when people actually are really good designers and they have a good quality thing, they'll go after and get big projects big projects take a lot and then they stop and then that that dips well there's a balance there of having diversity of project size having you know some large projects having the medium projects and having small projects and so it's how you you know pursue work so that's that's a big key factor once we get into the actual um you know getting to know companies um, we're interested in, in kind of where they are in the sector. It's like it's very important at that point to, to understand the people who's leading the company. Mm -hmm. And really, we do look at the top leadership, but our main interest is the next level of leadership. Have they have they empowered people? Have they have they exposed them to things? Have they given them experience or have they been a type of a culture that's, you know, only if you're in the C-suite, you get to see things. And um, so we look at those as what the opportunity or risk is. Um, and then the market sector, of course, uh, you want you want a good brand. You need it's very hard to take a team that hasn't have had a good brand and quality of production and try to turn that around. The other things you can fix, uh, but you have to have that core, you know, quality strength. And yeah, and, and we're not looking for fixer uppers, right? Firstly, not right now. Uh, <laughs> the second is we do have a belief that, you know, it's really hard to, um, you know, Todd alluded to this is the like brands organically developing brands uh, is very different uh, and very difficult. However, um, architectural firms struggle with this, but other businesses probably in other industries do better, that mm -hmm. every brand has a cycle, right? Yeah. Yep. And you have to recognize that. And it's better to go once the partnership changes and to look at a rebranding process, to look at what the, mm -hmm. what the next 10 years of this brand looks like and actually go through that. And that may mean you know, rebranding as a whole, that may mean developing a different mission statement. That may mean, hey, maybe two firms come together and form a different brand. These things are positive attributes to looking at brands rather than getting, you know, like GE is a good example. How many people know GE today? It was one of the largest brands today. And so yeah. if you look at the brand cycle and what's going on in the industry, it can tell us a lot about what you can do with branding yeah. moving forward for, for these firms. So it's it's very interesting. Then you know you have a, a kind of a, a pool or a portfolio of different architecture businesses that will become kind of acquired by Blue Water and the leaders of the practices. They're they're still maintaining some sort of ownership, so they've still got skin in the game. So they yeah. they kind of you know they've they've got an agenda as well, and and it kind of helps create the 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 legacy. What sort of exchange of resources do we see between the businesses that are in the portfolio? And do you ever merge those together or kind of actually, you know, acquire three businesses that are in the same sector and then say, let's create a super business that's a, an amalgamation? Like you, you, you merge all them together. Yeah, and in some parts, um, and it's always uh, tough to describe the the merging part because it, it can sound like we're saying both things uh, and both, talking about it both sides of our mouth. Because in the in the most part we won't merge, but it it kind of depends on the bigger picture. So when we have our our say acquisition A and our strategic for plan for them is to maybe grow in the western part of the country, maybe grow into the the country to the south or the north. Um, if mm -hmm. if we go acquire another smaller business that is to meet that goal, we would merge that into that company. And so it's it's no different than, you know, kind of executing that business plan of what it takes to grow on the larger blue water scale, though, if we wanted to go into the neighboring country and and find a new education you know type of leader, we 
wouldn't mix that with the residential team just to make a, a larger um, picture. So there's a little bit of, you know, kind of what the opportunity is, but it's really focused on what the objective is, is what are we trying to, which, which part of the business model are we, are we acquiring that business to improve? And, and that would decide it. So, um, so is it like kind of creating a super company sometimes in, in small parts, um, but the, the goal is to not merge the big parts. And we definitely don't want to cannibalize the businesses we right. acquire. That's a big part of what we look at. Like X, why are we looking at this company? If we already have a strong residential firm, let's say mm -hmm. X city, do we need to? And if we do, what does that represent? Do we need to bring in this other firm and have the conversation like, hey, can this coexist together or do they exist separately? So that's one. Um, you mentioned, you brought up the idea of sharing resources. Um, we do think that that part of our business is evolving. We do think that our model allows for more resiliency, meaning mm -hmm. two firms can potentially share resources mm -hmm. and um, potentially share revenue so that they don't have to hire because just Todd was saying, you know, sometimes you need to staff up for a short amount of time or limited and instead you're hiring 30 people. Well, maybe there's another part of the practice perhaps which is 10 people available and could. Yeah. So we do believe that our platform will provide that resiliency between the firms um, to do that. Oh, yeah, I, without I, doing, I, yeah. I, I could imagine that being a very valuable kind of resource of strengthening the businesses that, that you know, just particularly in something like hiring, yes. where, you know, one business is perhaps going for a bit of a dip or there's just, you know, it just becomes, Absolutely. you've got teams that can migrate with much more ease amongst a brother or a sister type yeah. of firm. Yeah, correct. And uh, a very interesting and it builds sharing. On, it builds on a um, uh, kind of pillar of success that we've seen work really well in the past is, you know, we, we've never in any of our companies or our experience, we've never believed in hiring and firing. So we don't want to staff up 30 right. people and, and we'll let them go at the end of the project. It, it, again, it's a people based business. It's, it creates a bad culture. It does not create, you know, strengthening of the, the overall resume and experience of the firm. And so we don't want to do that. And so what, what we've done in the past when we didn't, we, when we weren't buying different companies and have the sister companies, as you said, um, is partner. I mean, we're partnering in the industry is really, really strong. And we, we always believed that two people working together um, could be better than any one of them individually. And, and so there's a lot of benefits. And so there's just a stronger connection between that here. Um, but we don't, we don't insist on it. We don't force our, mm -hmm. our entities to, Hey, you have to go work with our, our sister company because you know we've been there and that's you know one of the tenants that we i guess we didn't say exactly is we are buying architecture leading architecture engineering companies and we are architects and engineers we've been there we've pursued the work we've had to win the the client we've had to you know strategically go after that project and we know when you have the wrong teammate when you have the wrong partner when you have the res wrong resume um it's not going to work and so you we yeah. need to have to build really strong teams and what we hope that that uh you know naturally becomes that that's more internal than than external but external partnering is a is a way through that as well so we're we're very agile with all those things we have some kind of um you know successful principles that we go by but uh, we don't force any of them and and mm -hmm. i know we're talking one after the other but there's so many things that that we've kind of um I would say in the nascent stage of growing is the partnering that Todd mentioned, you know, it extends right beyond just the firm's partnering. It goes to mentorship. So we have a mentorship program called Leap that we want to launch mm -hmm. where uh, essentially you could have a mentor in another blue water yeah. firm without actually having, because let's assume you're a 30, 40 person firm and there's, you meet with the same leaders over and over and you want to understand. Yeah something else. So maybe there's a 150, 200 person architecture firm or principal, really successful, different track, you really admire them. Can you go get mentored? So that's a big part of our mandate as well as to how do we grow and nurture talent and give mm -hmm. them opportunities across the, the platform. It's, it's, I, th I think that's similar to what you're doing, right? Yeah. You're trying to improve the industry, right? By exposure Absolutely. and more knowledge. And that's built off that kind of same foundation. Um, so, so how, what kinds of things do you do in terms of, of, of trainings and, and coaching and, and mentoring? Is this something that you as yeah. Blue Water provide in-house or do you liaise with other kind of consultants to, that, you, that you bring in um, and kind of do like an audit of a business and then diagnose and give different bits of training? Yeah. 
so we, yeah, so we, we believe, uh, I mean, we, we've gotten a lot of formal training ourselves as well, but, um, we believe a lot of on the job, uh, training, but the, the word that mm -hmm. I used a second ago, it's exposure. Um, a lot of people don't get the exposure to things. So we had a, a, a thing that we said a long time ago is take people to meetings that they don't need to go to, meaning they're not required because they're not on the team. They're not going to answer any particular question. They're going because they can hear, you know, how the CEO is going to handle that issue or how they're, the, the business development lead is going to handle the conversation. But they learn from that. Bring them into an executive meeting. And when you can cross pollinate, as Ari said with the LEAP program, is go look at another company. And the benefit of that is because when you do it in your own company, you know the people, you know the issues and you kind of have these you know predisposed kind of thoughts on well I think what we should do is that in that uh, in that problem when you go into a new company you're looking at it from a very fresh perspective and so it gives you exposure in a unique way mm -hmm. that isn't ex it doesn't exist in other companies um, and then and then you talk about it afterwards and and you see how decisions are made and and so that real life um, type of exposure is a good training uh, basis I mean we provide like Todd and myself, uh, as fractional executives, we we provide business education, honestly, and right. and like even the first firm, you know, we I handle a lot of the growth side of things. Todd handles a lot of the operational side of things, but we come together on various aspects. So, for example, you know, we go through training, like you know, what's your go no go process, and kind of go through actually a training process through that. You know, how do you pursue projects? Simple things like go no goes and. Then how do you target? What's the strategy? How do you figure out what kind of project? What is the diversity? And the greatest education, at least the way we've learned, and is giving people the transparency and exposure to the to your own numbers. So mm -hmm. instead of sending them and taking yeah. them, going, let them have an accounting course. Don't worry about the accounting course. Like just learn how to read your own Look numbers. Your own numbers. Yeah. And we do this month over month. Every month we go through them. And now people have it on the, you know, on the tip of the fingers. They know if I'm mentioning AR, they know accounts receivable. They know exactly what to do. And that nothing replaces that. I can guarantee you mm -hmm. nothing. Like you can go to an accounting course and learn all the terms and how to read a balance sheet. And if that's something that you want to do, Blue Water supports them to do that. But the big part of our aspect is we we fundamentally want to raise the level of each person's understanding yeah. of their own business. Mm -hmm. So it's an absolutely brilliant idea. And what I love about it as well is that it's, you know, so we hear so much about the the descent of the architecture industry. Um, and this is a this is a really like confident move in the long-term protection of the architecture firms and the industry and is, and is kind of, you know, very boldly saying, look, this is actually, these are really good businesses to be investing in over a long-term cycle um, and with a little bit of love and care and tension, you know, these, these become fantastic assets and, and very kind of good producers of, of architecture for the city. Um, what kind of time frame are you looking at? Like, how long does a transition take, or how long does an acquisition take? If if it's a, you said you don't, you know, you're not into kind of uh, finding fixer uppers. You know, if we're using like a property analogy, you want to be finding a business that's kind of solid and mature and has got and has got some good track record to it. What kind of time scale are you looking at in terms of? you know, initial conversations with the business owner to actually the acquisition to the kind of, you know, what sort of plan might you put in place to see a change in performance if there needs to be one? Yeah, it, uh, varying aspects of that. Um, I'd say to answer the first part of the question is the time frame is, you know, mm -hmm. I'd say um, probably four to 12 months is the time frame. And, and the four is, you know, you have initial conversation, people are really interested and motivated and, and you can get going and, and get through a process really, really quickly. That'd be really fast. Um, most times it takes uh, at least kind of four to six months to kind of learn each other. Um, and, and that happens in higher quality businesses. They're not racing towards any finish line. They're just looking at the opportunity and take some assessment time. So it typically kind of takes six months to kind of have that conversation and, and say, you know, we're both interested in this. We both see opportunities. Um, and there's value here. And then, and then uh, on the longer side, it can you know take time to go through due, due diligence on the larger companies, um, and you put those two together. But all, always less than a year, um, and that's if there's a lot of talking time up front. 
the on the on the post acquisition side um you know how how fast to see the transition it depends um you know there's there's different aspects that firms struggle with some is you know business operations and that stuff can ha- happen relatively quickly assuming they have a decent system um and basis of operations if that needs to change then it's is a little longer but you can start to see the the changes in in 3 to 4 months um when it's kind of just simple discipline type of of aspects um, but if there's larger, um, you know, ac- work acquisition type of problems, or, uh, then that can be a little bit different because you've got to kind of train new people. You have to get a new message out to the client base. You have to maybe add a service sector, bring in a new individual to raise the bar a little bit. And you're into probably a 12, 18 month uh, type of transition on something like that. And one of the first things we do is essentially... Um, you know, it starts with once you have finished the acquisition process that Todd spoke about, which sometimes varies between six to 12 months. And, you know, we're starting to use technology a lot more and try to get some of the stuff shortened up. Um, but, um, you know, it starts with kind of once we've done the acquisition is a state of the union. So we try to mm-hmm. understand what is the practice all about and go through kind of a strategic plan process. Many of these firms, even larger firms sometimes, have actually done a strategic plan. And when we look at some of the strategic plans they have done, um, you know, um, I would say they're missing actions. You know, a lot of great plans, people don't know how to follow through because you may have some gold idea, but you don't know the 10 steps that sure. you to get there. Um, so how do you refine those? And then along with that, we develop what is called a market plan, which is a budget. Like what do three years of revenue look like? Like how are we going to grow? And it's always stretch, uh, meaning if you think we grow, the organic growth rate is somewhere between four to eight percent, and you've already been growing between twelve percent. Can we can we stretch it? Can we do eighteen percent? What are the different organic and inorganic strategies we can look at? Like is that a small acquisition? Is that a strategic hire? Is that mm-hmm. team takeout? There's lots of tools and. I'd say strategies, small actions that are available to us that we can. And, you know, to be fair, some of these firms never have had the financial wherewithal to even undertake some of this. But now yeah. through Blue Water, we can actually go and buy another smaller firm to add to something in a different city or get a different strategic car mm-hmm. like Todd was talking about. So mm-hmm. um, it's just, you know, it's there is no one simple set formula. Depends. <laughs> it all answer, depends. The great answer of it depends. <laughs> Have you have you considered or in the future thought about you know buying one of these some of these businesses and kind of flipping them? So I know we're not in the in the game of the kind of fixer uppers, but yeah. there, there 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 might be opportunities where it would make sense that perhaps you you know you you work with them for a period of time, you've got them under your and your ownership, and then it might be appropriate for both parties to part ways and yeah. then you you sell them. There, there may be a time for fixer uppers, um, you know, at, at early stages, you know, we're yeah. focused on really good brands where, where I think you look for fixer, fixer uppers again, it's like, what is your objective? You're not mm-hmm. going to do that to get into a market because if I think the definition of fixer upper would be maybe they're not really strong in their, their work getting and things like that. But if you um, have a team that's really, really good at uh, work acquisition and winning projects, um, and they need they need good resources. Some of those those teams have really good dedicated resources, and so you can mix those in. And so so sure. there will be a time and a, a phase for that. Um, but the flipping, not really. Um, you know, we're looking for businesses that are long term. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and and we're we're looking for um, a longer horizon of you know growing. You know. Because, like I said, it can take you know anywhere from kind of six to eighteen months, depending on what we're doing, and then you want to kind of see the benefit of that for a long period of time, um, you know. So not, it's not on our on our radar is is the flipping. We have been approached by you know few firms where they they have identified that they want to go through some activity in five or six years, and whether we would come in as kind of minority investors or whatever yeah. and try to be part of that. Um, but like Todd said, and perhaps it's our fault because we're just really passionate about actually going in and trying to own yeah. these businesses. And so that's, that's not really our model, but that doesn't mean that in the future, like Todd said, something might crop up and maybe look at it, but that's not, you know, kind of. Yeah. Game yeah. That makes sense. In one area that we haven't talked about, Ryan, yeah. that, that is a really core part of uh, blue water is technology. Um, so right. in, in, 
we didn't talk about kind of our platform services and stuff and maybe a future podcast but um one of the core tenants is is the infusion of technology like ari said uh, the industry is, is very challenged with adopting it. We've been through it ourselves. I've led a good group of good sized group of people, you know, through the Revit um, uh, phase and a lot of people, you know, going to 3D and BIM modeling, you know, struggled a lot. Um, and it's very easy to see when you look at smaller firms that, uh, you know, have been run by a single owner that started, you know, on the drawing board. And um, so it's very understandable. But it is changing so extremely fast now with the AI adoption and, and the opportunities within the firm. So we have a lot of you know great um, objectives of what we're trying to achieve there. I'm confident that we'll achieve them, but there could be something along the way. You know, if I looked at an opportunity to do that, is is spinning off something that you know if we were able to coalesce a good solution of technology and it became widely ad- adaptable and was had a lot more value than just the firms that we owned. You know, something like that could uh, potentially be there someday. But that's a that's a strong core tenant of ours too, is the technology. Well, th- this is quite interesting, actually. The the, te- the the technology component of it, and certainly when we start looking at architectural businesses, of how sometimes reluctant they've been to adapt and change. The, you know, we see practices using drawing methods from you know fifteen years ago, and their workflow remains the same and. You know, you know, you have people like Sam Altman talking about the possibility of a, a billion dollar revenue company operated by one person. Yeah. Right. And that as a vision for like what an, what a business, you know, where business is going is just kind of mind boggling. And to think now as well, what's possible with a very small team of architects um, utilizing AI, that's only going to get, you know, much, much grander. The implementation of technology for efficiency is yeah, it's massively, it's something that, you know, I think a lot of businesses are actually quite, they're fearful of in many ways. And there are businesses that are kind of proactively looking for new ways of um, of, of dealing with it. Uh, are, are you guys kind of liaising with the, the AI world at all or um, other, other even software companies about how to, you know, things like BQE Core and Monograph, these other organizations where they're yeah. producing very good financial management um, bits of software which can really elevate an architecture practice. Do you guys liaise with other sorts of um, collaborating partners to help businesses integrate technology? Yeah, so I mean, firstly, on the financial um, aspect, we do have our own financial platform that we are developing. Right. Um, it's, I wouldn't say the platform is doing internal mathematics, it's more about dashboarding the information. And so mm-hmm. things like what Monograph and stuff are doing we have our own version of that where we take the information from the ERP systems and we kind of project them out to the the metrics we have. That's one of the Mm -hmm. tools that every Blue Water firm is going to have access to. So so when it comes to that financial piece, we we think we are in a very good place. Um, In terms of technology, you know, Todd and I just met and we have finalized our kind of uh, uh, agreement with an individual who's going to come on and lead our technology solutions for the for the mm-hmm. time being, and we're in, we're looking at three different uh, buckets. Um, the first bucket is around internal automation, so workflow automation, whether it's in Python and Revit or whatever be the case, um, and and it's not just limited to drawing. So, for example, like you know timesheets, like if you're creating a software or whatever be the case. Like for example, simple thing, you know. Sometimes a project is in the in the sales cycle and it converts to a project. In most firms, once that happens, there's an email that goes to somebody and the accountant has to say, yes, I'm going to create this on the ERP system. Somebody's going to go into the server, create the same folder structure. That's simple. That's such low hanging fruit, you know? So the way we do it is we have a bot that pops up on Microsoft Teams. It asks you eight questions. You answer the eight questions. This thing goes in the background, just automates and does all of that. Your server, you know, on the server, the folder structure is created, the template's already there. Mm-hmm. The the project has been created on the Dell Tech system or ERP system or whatever be the case. Um, the second bucket is um, client-facing solutions, and that ranges everything from computational design. And we are not talking about computational design in terms of just creating fancy facades. We are talking about computational design at a more 
urban level analysis. That's what we right. really succeeded in our previous firm on really creating different value propositions to computational design. Really, really comparing public sources of data or other lots of 20, 30 sources of data to get to kind of real time analysis and bringing value to the clients. And the third bucket is kind of what is the low, low hanging fruit when it comes to AI right now that could be immediately implemented. So things like Copilot, like our firms are already starting to use Copilot for the proposals process. And mm -hmm. how can you quickly analyze um, RFPs and decide whether you go for this or not? And, and what are the keywords? So we can, we are already starting to do a lot of that. Um, but the AI, there's a lot of noise around AI right now. And what our strategy to that is a little bit of wait and watch, but let's start to implement the things that are easy, that can be implemented right yeah. now in the practice. So. Brian, I wanted to, I wanted to comment on two, pull two words out of your, your kind of statement there was uh, efficiency is, is certainly number one, and Ari touched on that a little bit, but the fearfulness. Yeah. And I think yes. that, you know, when you look at adoption, it, it is fearfulness, because sometimes it's it's a lot of people that, again, yeah. if you're looking at a generation that started on drawing board or even started in, in AutoCAD, um, it's, I don't understand that. And, and, um, uh, and my, and it's easy to see my job could go away. And we've had this conversation with firms yeah. as soon as we mention AI of saying like, Hey, you can't replace the designer. And we agree with that hundred percent. We don't want it. And we think the more bold you can be on adoption, the more you can, you can highlight the design practice. And what we mean by that is taking away all the things that we don't want to do. Nobody wants to spend their time, you know, reviewing specifications to the nth degree to change the glue product that we need, uh, you know, for the, for the uh, project. And, and in that, um, you know, comes more faults. And so we can drive higher quality by having those things done. What we want to do is take the time dedicated to a project and put more of it in design. Um, we are mm -hmm. actually not working on a lot of generative AI type of things and having a computer create um, the solutions. And so I think there's a balance to, you know, Sam Altman, you know, I, I believe what he's, I, I believe a lot in what he's, he's saying the vision is of what is capable for certain types of companies. But um, we really value the design aspect of the business. And, and our motivation is to enhance that, enrich that, make the good designers even better and more powerful designers, um, but take away the mundane part of the business. Nobody went to school to pour through, you know, 3000 pages of specifications for the heck of it. So yeah, I think, you know, the, to sum it up, it's like technology should be in the service of humans, not yeah. technology yes. for the sake of technology. Yeah. And ours is a people based yeah. business. So hand in hand. Yeah, abs absolutely. And, and it's amazing, you know, some, so much of the inefficiency in architecture happens as a result of you've got very intelligent, highly qualified, trained people doing very repetitive, right. monotonous, yeah. you know, data entry types of yeah. jobs, absolutely. which is a, which is a real killer. What do you think as kind of, you know, you're, you know, you've, you've really put your money where your mouth is here in investing into the architecture industry. What are some of your, challenges and some of the opportunities that you see long term perhaps over the next decade that you as an organization as a as a, a kind of company investing and acquiring um practices need to be vigilant of and are looking to you know capitalize on as well yeah i mean challenges there's uh there's a lot of challenges in in to the technology portion um so you know mm -hmm. i would i would Describe it as a lot more opportunity than challenges, but there are challenges in that. Um, I think you're going to find firms, and and you got to look at our our business too. Is uh, when I talk of what I what we just talked about of our perspective of how that goes, the clients might have a different perspective. The clients might say, you know, I want to find a firm that can use that AI and and you know do my whole project for fifty bucks and. Um, you know, save me all this time and have it done by tomorrow and have it be perfect. That would be detrimental to the industry. And I think it's it's not possible, but people following that path and not having a thorough understanding of how it all goes. And that's that's a challenge. It, that's a challenge going to be in, in every industry as people adopt AI. You yeah. grab onto the buzzwords and don't understand it thoroughly. So that's, that's going to be um, a challenge for sure. The opportunity is... Um, or, or another challenge is how many people go into the profession and maybe those two things, you know, solve, solve um, each other. 
but the, the entire jobs landscape and, and where people go into education and the changing education system, you know, that's an impactful um, aspect as well. We need, we, the industry is lacking good people, enough good people right now. Um, we want to maybe merge these concepts so it pro provides part of the solution, but you need that good quality design aspect for sure. Um, ultimately, you know, Todd touched upon this really early when we were talking about kind of what we're investing in terms of portfolios and stuff, right? Ultimately, um, we are not following any trendy fashion trends and things like that of what's hot right now. Uh, we yeah. are really following mega trends. So, you know, housing is going to continue to be a, a challenge, you know. There's a huge migration uh, challenge that's happening all over the world when it comes to uh, labor. Um, there's attitudes towards home ownership are changing, especially in they're among the late. These are mega trends onshoring and reshoring, especially when it comes to North America and you know everything mm -hmm. going on with wars. These things are mega trends, and they're going to continue to um, change and redirect our profession. So we are really looking and following. You know, you know when you do housing, your education follows, transportation follows. So uh, the core tenets of our thinking and opportunity is is really still sticking to what we think are global challenges. You know, climate, yeah. I haven't even touched upon that. Um, government spending on infrastructure and how that cycle comes around every 10, 15 years. So we're mm -hmm. really looking at those kinds of mega trends rather than jumping on the bandwagon or bus of something that we somebody, like, you know, generative AI right now. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. We're trying to kind of stick to where we think long-term things are going to move in the industry. Yeah, amazing. And just to conclude the conversation here, if there are people that are listening to this podcast and feel like they might be a good partner for you guys or, or want to find out more about how you guys could collaborate, what would be their best course of action? Call up Dodd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reach out to us on uh, uh, bluewater.io is our website. Um, and no E's in that blue water. Um, we had to be unique in our spelling. So it's B-L-U-W-A-T-R. Um, but reach out to either of us and uh, we're, happy to, we're happy to explore. We, you probably can tell we love the industry. We love um, the topic. And, and even if, um, you know, we like talking to companies that don't work out um, in acquisition and just talk about, you know, what they're doing, what, what uh, interesting things they're challenged with. And um, like I said, Ryan, that's why we found a great fit with you is, is trying to improve the industry. There's a lot of opportunities for this industry um, and it's a great long-term profession for sure. Absolutely. Love it. Well, Todd, Ari, thank you so much for your conversation today. Absolutely fascinating and really exciting to to be hearing and talking about a business like this. Um, wonderful. Really, well, really great. Well, thank you for thank having you. us. We really enjoyed it, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show, and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.